what's at stake? Well, universalism. Uh, I think the, the mistake of the Anglicans was to kind of co-opt it to a nationalist position. So the Anglican Church got too wedded with the state, with the, the national power of England, and then, um, <clears throat> you know, the British Empire as the result, which, let's say, has a checkered history when it comes to triumphalist, capitalist, um, you know, imperialism. Um, and I think the Catholic Church, um, in its deepest sense, I don't think we've got it yet. I mean, I think if we, if we were to truly tune into the Holy Spirit, as I suggested at the beginning, um, we would find that all the churches uh, have not fulfilled the promise, really. We haven't lived up to Christ's teachings. Um, we haven't created a world of peace. We live in a world where there's far too much poverty and suffering. There's too much illness. I mean, what Christ wanted us to do was look after the poor, look after those less fortunate than ourselves, look after those who are sick, heal them, um, not use violence. So I would like a civilization that did all that. That would be a truly Christian civilization. I think I'm with Schweitzer, who said that's why when he went to Africa, he just went as a doctor. Um, and Teilhard de Chardin was another great thinker who was truly universal, who was interested in archaeology and helped discover Peking man and all that stuff. So um, there's a lot of work to be done, but <clears throat> I think there's some truth in the Protestant, some in the Catholic, and that's why I always call myself a Catholic Protestant. I'm both. And in the Anglican Church, we try and say that, we try and live up to that. But there's always this temptation to, I mean, it disgusts me that someone like Boris Johnson can, can you know, uh, hijack what Britain stands for and, and claim to be some kind of an Anglican when he's simply mendacious. Um, <clears throat> so to me, the core, that's why I'm also a Quaker, I believe that the core is about speaking truth to power, as Christ did, um, and finding that universal wisdom within us all. So anyway, that's my take on the Protestant. Any any comments or questions? Um, <clears throat> I, I I will come back to archaeology and anthropology, and uh, this afternoon I could listen to the text of uh, Le Petit Prince de Saint Exupéry. Oh, okay. And uh, of course, at the end, uh, raise the uh, the fact that we die. And uh, I think that the main point of uh, maybe our Western civilization at that time is that we, we lost the contact with death. And uh, I don't know what uh, you think about that, but I feel that that changed the level of thinking, uh, the level of contact with the Holy Spirit, because we, we lost the contact with death. Hmm. Well, it's a theory. I think some people have argued that. Um, a, a, a good intellectual, Ernest Becker, wrote a book called The Denial of Death. Um, I think he would support your view. He was a Freudian. <clears throat> and he said that as a culture, we are now, we suppress the fact of death. We try and extend life by medicine. Uh, we want to explore chirogenics and, and live forever in cold state and have immortality and um, so the whole of civilization is a sort of conspiracy to suppress the fact of death he said and this is very puerile and it leads to a lopsided psychological development because it's a fact and um, so we should just accept that <clears throat> anyway he, he's one of the people um, I I know from my own personal life experience that I spent some of my 20s working in hospitals um, as a young man of choice. I you know, wanted to do something and I just felt it was a way of giving back to society. And because my father had died early when I was 17, um, which had a big impact on the family, um, I felt that working with dying people would be, in, you know, um, 
a way of understanding life because I wanted to understand the meaning of life. Right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, I learned a, a huge amount from working in Canada with veterans who often died. I, people I got to know and be friends with. I was the last guy that would talk to them often. And they told me their life stories. And these were old soldiers who fought in World War One. So, like, you know, they were old in the 1970s, in their 80s and 90s. And so I don't think I lost touch with death. <clears throat> I, I don't think one can overgeneralize here. I mean, to me, I respect these old soldiers who are now long dead. They taught me a huge amount, and they live on through me. And one of them, Mr. Bonthron, who's long dead, a Scottish guy, he gave me a mission. He said, Thomas, World War I was totally stupid. It was terrible. You have to go back to Europe and stop World War Three, he said, because that'll be even worse. <laughs> so my peace mission came from working with these old soldiers when I learned how horrible the war had been. And these people just couldn't believe how terrible it was. And they were being forced to go and kill other people just like them, young German soldiers. Mm. So I think talking to them and learning their life stories <clears throat> convinced me of the need to work for peace, um, to prevent World War Three, And that's what I'm still doing. You know, I wish I'd... I feel like personally responsible for this Ukraine war and the Gaza war. I should have stopped all this. I don't know what else I could have done. Um, Is there another uh, compliment to what you are saying? Which is really beautiful. Thank you for uh, this testimony. But another uh, way of looking at it is well, death is not so important. It's the, the last healing. It's death. So even if there is war, uh, it's parts of life. I'm familiar with that argument, yes. And However, where I differentiate is modern weapons are so vast and powerful that it's not war anymore. It's cheating. If somebody sitting in a bunker in Texas yeah. or in Moscow fires a missile that kills a thousand people, a thousand miles away, it's cheating. It's not war. It's yeah. just surgical annihilation. And so that the distancing from actual fighting is now a problem. And this is what science has brought us and technology. And now we're on the threshold of being able to destroy all human civilization with yeah. a massive nuclear exchange, you know. That's what I'm trying to stop. I mean, if you want to, if, if, I mean, I'm very happy to encourage battle reenactments. If a whole bunch of Russian and Ukrainian people want to do fighting with swords and reenact the ancient battles, let's have a special place on the planet where they can do that. And they can have heroic, you know, adventures. That's what war was like in primeval times, primitive times. The headhunters of Borneo and I've studied this as an anthropologist, they do ritual combat every now and then. You know, <clears throat> if somebody from one tribe insults someone from the other tribe, they then declare a war, and then the strong young men of both sides all get their long spears, which are about like 10 feet long, with sharpened points, and they go to a designated field, and they go through a ritual display of aggression. They chant, they shout, and they jab the spears <clears throat> at each other. And this lasts like half a day. But it's all a ritual thing. And, and if once blood is drawn, it stops. Mm. Like animals, yeah, for it's, example. They're not there to kill each other because that's stupid. There aren't enough people to do that. They, they know when to stop. It's just to let off steam do the chanting, so they work out the aggression. And whoever gets the first little bit of blood has won, you know. Um, now that's, rip, that's proper warfare combat. Um, what, we, what we do now is not, it's cheating. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, you know, it has tragic consequences for the victims, the survivors, um, usually the women and children. And also those who are wounded. So, 
But anyway, no, thanks for that point. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to ask the Goths what, what, what insights they can give us here. Because we're mere mortals, we can't work it out. We can try. <laughs> but um, it's Easter Sunday, let's see if, um, if there's any um, hope over the horizon. You know, <laughs> one hopes. Yes, hello. One hopes for hope. Right, you do your first. Hmm. Better, better. Okay, yeah. He keeps coming up, but we'll have him again. He, it is his time, Beltane. So that's good. Thank you. Right. Hmm. How's the fire doing? Oh. It's red. Okay, so there is heat there happening. Good. Bishy, why don't you go and sit on the fire, darling? Go, go and uh, explore the fire. There you are. Then I can look at these cards. Hmm. Right, so we've got two... Um, We've got the Ten of Fire, which is Bell, <clears throat> and we'll look at him first. Um. <sighs> mm. And we've just had Beltane, which is the, um, <coughs> the sort of evening of the 1st of May, and then the next day. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful time of year when people like to celebrate and dance. And um, in the Druid world, we like to um, have wisdom affairs, get married, and dance around the fire with our consort. And if you leap over the fire with your beloved, as I've done a couple of times, then that means you're married, handfasted. Um, in the Druid tradition for a year and a day, because it's thought that it might lapse naturally. But if you want to renew it, then you, 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 you can renew it. That's fine too. So Bel is the god of the sun and the fire god. <clears throat> it's called Belinos or Belinos. Um, some think he was equivalent to Apollo and the etymology might go back. Bel, Apollo might be the same. Um, and so we know that he was popular here in Gaul. Abellio was um, a god, worshipped. He's often associated with, with the sun, with light, but also a healing god. There are sanctuaries to Bel, which were healing sanctuaries. So you'd go there to receive healing if you were ill. Um, one of the great tribal leaders of Roman Britain, Cunobelinos, uh, his name means the Hound of Belinos, and uh, it comes in the name Billingsgate, which is a part of London, again, is there. So many words, of Bell gets into a lot of ancient place names in Gaul and, and throughout the Celtic world, in fact. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's come into our cards today because really we're being told to heal these conflicts. I mean, the ancients have worked out that the sun wants us to be healed and that the beauty of life is what we should be celebrating. We should be celebrating love and eros and connectedness and the joined upness of creation, which is what eros is about, not death and destruction. And Plato in the symposium jotted down the amazing discussion about eros with Diotima and the others discussing. And I just want a little little flag of synchronicity here. People know that I'm a great fan of Plato and I talk about him. And this whole place is dedicated to the nine muses, right? And we're sitting in the room of Apollo, who's Bell. Um, and I've been going on about this for ages and people think it's slightly quaint, but you know. Anyway, I just want to say that if you didn't know, archeologists, going back to archeology, span have deciphered an ancient papyrus from Herculaneum, which was charred at the time of Vesuvius' eruption. They've now got this ability to 
to using laser light to go down and scan into the text because they can't open the scroll, it's too charred. So they can read it. It's brilliant what they can do. And in this text, they've, they've worked out where Plato is buried. And this is really interesting because we've never found the grave of Plato before. Um, and guess where he's buried? He's buried in, in the grounds of the academy in Athens, which I've been to. I've been to a philosophical conference there in 2013, the World Congress of Philosophy. And he's buried by the Temple of the Muses. This is what the text says. And this is the Temple of the Muses, right? So um, I just thought that's an interesting synchronicity. And to me, the Greeks were lovers of, of Apollo. They were lovers of the sun, of light. And Apollo was the god of healing for them. And, and all Plato was trying to do with philosophy was to worship the muses and, and restore sanity to mankind. That we remember our, our semi-divine nature. You know, we are mortal, we die, yes. But we return to the Elysian fields. Our immortal soul lives on, is what Plato was saying. And I just wish more people realised that. That's why I think... Um, <clears throat> Plethon was so correct at the um, Florentine gathering to, to emphasize this. Um, by the way, about that, great tragedy happened because the great, one of the great intellectuals in Florence was Cardinal Bessarion, Greek, universal, great scholar, uh, lover of manuscripts, collector of you know, all the old Platonic dialogues. Now, he should have been elected pope, in 1455 or whatever it was, there was an election for Pope, and he stood, and he lost by like one vote to some, sorry to say, some, some sort of third-rate, you know, um, <coughs> kind of jostling politician type of person. Um, from, from, I think, Na from um, Naples, he was a Borgia from the Spanish tradition, um, who, who was... You know, not a bad person, but not of the same calibre as Bessarion. And I think if Bessarion had been elected, what I've talked about, this idea of a universal church, East and West, in unity, would have happened then. So history is sad the way it, it kind of doesn't always make the right logical turnings. But anyway, I just thought I'd share that thing about Plato's grave being found. Um, and... Archaeologists will probably want to go and do, you know, uh, sonic testing and see if they can actually find the body, which would be very, very interesting if that's, that turns up. I'd say leave it down there. Um, but um, unless there's some ancient scrolls buried with him, like his autobiography or something, <laughs> then definitely go down. So that's, that's that one, Belinos, um, or Bell. And then we have as if that's not cosmic enough, we have the card that represents the queen of the air. And, you know, if I was Shakespeare writing a sonnet, I would I'd write a poem now for the queen of the air. And, in fact, there are quite a few of his poems that could be characterised as such. This is the card called Eon. Um, we've had him before. Yes, uh, not a long time ago. Yeah, no. but he's such a crafty and profound card that uh -huh. I think he's, he seems to want to come in again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, he represents time and space. Um, he's got the zodiac around him in this circle. Um, and he's surrounded by a snake, which represents the Kundalini. And he's got wings, so he's an angelic force. And he was worshipped in the Orphic tradition which is the ancestor of the Platonic tradition. Orpheus was the founder of the sort of muses worship that Plato comes from and that Pythagoras came from. And he was very important in the, um, the Dionysian mysteries and the mysteries of Cybele, who was the great goddess. So the goddess Sophia is Cybele, really. Um, and later, um, philosophers understood eons role, um, he was a symbol, if you want, of, you know, what, what physicists talk about, relativity theory. They think 
everything you know like is expl explicable through relativity theory and quantum theory and when they're reconciled um and they and their eyes glaze over once they've said that because like that explains everything but when you ask them to actually explain relativity theory and quantum theory they can't do it nor can einstein <laughs> it's just a sort of faith thing I think Eon was the equivalent in the classical intellectual world. He was the relativity theory of the ancients. And basically what it's saying is that beyond all time and space is a divine intelligence which organises everything. And, and that was the point of astrology. It was trying to find the code according to which time is, is, is measured and meted out. And all our lives are organized through Eon. Now, <clears throat> Carl Jung wrote a whole book, Eon, researches into the phenomenology of the self about Eon, and he explores the, the role of Eon, for instance, in synchronicities. Eon's having fun when you have a synchronicity, like this thing about Plato I've just shared. Here I am in the Temple of the Muses going on about it, and there we discover his grave is right at the Temple of the Muses, you know. Well, that's a synchronicity. That's Eon having a laugh. And I think some people don't seem to get the joke. You see, I would say that if you look at things through Eon's perspective, the whole Ukraine-Russia thing is a joke. They're the same people. It's like different parts of Eon fighting each other. They've got to fall back in love with each other. I have dear, dear Russian friends and dear, dear Ukrainian friends. They're like cousins and some of the greatest intellectuals of modern history have been either Russian or Ukrainian I'm not going to choose between them I love them all and the same with the Palestinians the Christians the Muslims and the Jews in this dreadful Palestinian Israeli conflict they're all parts of Eon from a higher cosmic perspective and it's interesting archaeologists have found traces of this um, in Syria, the Middle East, the land that we call Palestine, Israel, there are little traces that these, these Eon was worshipped there. In one of the synagogues they found in Syria, there are astrological maps in the synagogue. So, you know, um, <clears throat> they totally understood that the Gnostic tradition teaches that we, we honour the phases and cycles of time. Um, and... Yeah, and in the Gnostic Church, they talk about the perfect eon out of which everything arises, the source of the, of the pure silence from which the goddess herself comes. Valentinus, the great Gnostic teacher of Egyptian Christianity, talks about eon with reverence. Um, and <clears throat> it became a very complex sort of cosmology where there are different eons manifest certain planes and energies, a bit like quantum theory. God leaps from plane to plane and, and emits different kinds of energies. You know, it's like cosmic quantum theory. Um, but it's all one eon doing it. This is the joke. So, um, I mean, Freud wrote a wonderful book about humour, trying to understand where it comes from. And it's about recognising similarity in, in, in difference. Most humour is about, ah... Oh, getting the joke that what you thought were two are actually one thing. or And so <clears throat> I think we've got to bring Eon's sense of humour um, to heal, to bring to heal the, the conflicts we're facing. And in conflict resolution theory, we you know, humour is very, very important. Um, and, of course, psychopathic people don't like humour because you can't do humour unless you can laugh at yourself. And if you're totally psychopathic and just hate, which is what psychopaths do, then you can't laugh at yourself because that shows weakness. And in their mind, that means, you know, you can get me now. Whereas if you realise the joke behind existence, then we're all manifestations of Eon, you know. Um, and it's time we got the joke and started doing peace. Because that's, that's far more fun you can have much more of a laugh um, doing peace work than war work, you know. By the way, a couple of my friends got married over Beltane, 
in Sark in the Channel Islands. So congratulations to Jolie and her new consort for the wedding. And that's a very good timing to have a wedding and hope you danced around the Beltane fires. And I hope to all, all my other friends that may have got married or have fasted this past Beltane. Congratulations, don't let the love light go out. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there. Any final comments, points, questions? Okay. Okay, thank you so much for listening.